Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Watershed University and today's topic, the epic water year of 2017. I'm Michael Anderson, state climatologist for California. I work in the Division of Flood Management and the Hydrology and Flood Operations Office. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to do uh, three areas for the talk today. First up, the setup, the antecedent conditions. What led us into water year 2017? What were the expectations? Then we get into the second part, what actually happened. A record breaking winter, snow melt, and high heat. Uh, finishing off then with some emergency response experiences and what our opportunities to learn from this year as we move forward. So heading in actually at the end of water year 2015, so two years ago, we set a rather uh, challenging record in the driest four year sum of precip in 120 years. And here's a plot of that, and we see that. Uh, that 20 year stretch during the Dust Bowl years in the 20s and 30s uh, hold a number of places there in two through five. However, 2015 outdid them all by more than an inch. As we headed towards 2016, we had the expectations of the Grand El Nino that didn't quite materialize. And we'll get into a little bit of that as we then move forward into what happened this year. So let's go to the next one. So here we are. Here's a plot of Climate Division data. So Climate Division 2 is essentially the Sacramento watershed. And these are NOAA's climate divisions. We have seven of them for California. On the y-axis, we have our annual precipitation accumulation in inches. And on the x-axis, we have the annual average temperature. So we take essentially all the data in the Sacramento Basin and mash it up one dot for each year. The yellow triangle there in the middle is the period of record average. All the orange diamonds there represent data from 1895 to 2000. Speak up a little bit, please. Sure. So we have 1895 to 2000 in the orange diamonds. And then in the black squares, we have 21st century. Highlighted the last several years, as you see, they're well outside the range of the other years in the distribution. 2013, uh, setting a new dry, and 2014 and 15, setting new warmth. Before we get to that Grand El Nino 2016, better than average for the first time in a number of years, but still not quite up in those uh, really wet years uh, that we see there. Uh, so given that setup, let's go ahead and go to the next one. We'll look at snowpack. So here we have a plot of the April 1 snowpack percent of average on the y-axis. And that comes from the Department of Water Resources statewide average. And on the x-axis, we have a value from the California Climate Tracker. This is, let's see if I can talk a little louder here with uh, the microphone to pick up here a little better. So what we have here on the y-axis is the percent of average uh, April 1 snowpack from 1950 uh, through to 2016. And on the x-axis, we have a product from the California Climate Tracker from Western Region Climate Center. And we're looking at the Sierra region, that long orange a highlighted area there on the map. And we're looking at the average minimum temperature for December, January, February. And I highlighted the 50% of average line and freezing uh, in the y-axis there. And we look at 2013, 14, and 15, three years in a row below 50% of average. It's the first time that happened. And then uh, we look at 2015, a record worst April 1 snowpack at 5% of average, but an average winter minimum temperature for the Sierra region at 32.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, not a good number to have achieved. But then we look at 2016, the snowpack didn't quite get to average, uh, even that with that Grand El Nino, and still warmer than average. So that sets us up for what happened this year. And I want to start with the premise of what we really focus on, uh, key phenomena that affects California, both for water supply and for flooding. And they relate to atmospheric rivers. Atmospheric rivers are these narrow bands of water vapor, mostly concentrated in the first 15,000 feet of the atmosphere. And as these extend from the tropics into the mid-latitudes, they get wrapped up in storm systems, uh, represented here by that L for a low pressure system. And as those wrap in ahead of the cold front, that brings a lot of warm, moist air in that then interacts with California's topography, our fantastic mountains, yielding really good precipitation. The size of these atmospheric rivers, the number and the strength of them are result from alignment of a bunch of physical processes happening in the atmosphere that operate on different space and time scales. 
And as we start to understand this, and we highlighted a few of them there, we have ENSO, our El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, we have uh, the Madden Julian Oscillation, or Tropical Convection over there in the Western Pacific. And then we have an easterly wave. So we have everything from ENSO, which is a multi-year phenomenon, MJO, which is on the order of months, and an easterly wave, which is a transient feature that can occur over the process of a week or so. And all these working together on different space and time scales helps set the stage for those weather systems as they come in, they are as they hit California, and the characteristics of all that that either give us a bountiful snowpack and water supply or flooding and everything in between. So in the past, we've known that ENSO is the key driver of interannual uh, variability in our weather. And we have El Nino, which flattens out the jet stream, speeds it up, and normally sends precipitation more concentrated into Southern California. Uh, this past year, we had a little hitch where it uh, turned out ENSO is not the sole driver that it used to be. And that created a little hitch where all that extra precip actually went into the Pacific Northwest, Portland and Seattle getting record precip last year when they normally should be dry. Uh, then we transitioned in for this water year into not quite a La Nina, but you notice a big change in the circulation there, where we go into a much more looping circulation with a high pressure in the Aleutians that maybe it goes up and over and we get cold air or it goes under and we tap into those warm tropical systems. Now, if we look over on the right side of the slide, we see the setup that happened this year where that high is actually over the Aleutians, opening the door for those lows to dip under, tap in to that uh, tropical moisture you see with the green arrows there, but you also see that cold air that wraps in from the continent and gets that cold air, which is really helpful for snowpack. You get all those working together, you end up with uh, the kind of year that we saw. Now, I had an interesting interview during our drought with the New York Times and gave the statement. We've seen these patterns before, but they're happening in a warmer world. I separate them because they only use the first part of the quote. Um, but this is really important to notice. The gel circulation has its features, but the way they interact and the way they behave in a warmer world may not be the same that we saw in the past. And with that, then we roll into what happened this year, and this year was fantastic. So here's a product actually from the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. They're down at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego. And a great group of people down there who are focusing on atmospheric river research. And they provided this product for this year, which is fantastic. Gives us a sense of what happened. Between October 1 and April 12, 49 atmospheric rivers hit the west coast of the United States. And you see all the dots and uh, arrows there showing where the landfalls were. And that represents where the atmospheric river first made contact with the land. Uh, they move dynamically across the landscape, but this gives us a sense of where they first interact. Now, the different colors are associated with the different strengths of the atmospheric river. A weak atmospheric river, really our lowest threshold of what we would consider an atmospheric river in terms of moisture and wind combinations, and that is that fantastic value called IVT, Integrated Vapor Transport. So the amount of water vapor that's being transported ahead of that cold front into uh, the land surface. And so for the winter, we see the different numbers that we had with uh, 12 weak ones, 21 moderate ones, 13 strong ones, and three extreme. Now you want to say, we say, wow, this is greater than normal, but we don't yet have the full climatology for this. We're developing this as we go. So hopefully in the coming years, we'll get a better sense of just how odd this year was. But you, you look really closely there at two of the pink arrows. You see one there that's uh, in January, and one that's in February that both make landfall right there near the Russian River watershed, right in Northern California, almost right on top of each other. Usually when we get one big flood, we get one, but to have two in back-to-back -back months that almost hit in the exact same place, pretty amazing. All right, let's keep moving. Here's another plot that I like to joke is a great way to make everybody dive for their smartphone, but we're going to dig through this. This is a lot of data that my friend Ben Hatchett up at uh, University of Nevada, Reno, Western Region Climate Center, put together for me. And it takes advantage of a lot of the new data streams that we have with atmospheric rivers. And he overlaid them all together to kind of show the story of this winter, which he called a subtropical symphony. It's a lot of things working together. And so the little green, light green stripes are representations of when the atmospheric rivers show up. At the very top, we have the precipitable water. And this is a sensor at Bodega Bay, which looks at how much water vapor is right over that point. And we have the threshold there at 20 millimeters 
which gives a sense above that, we consider that an atmospheric river. So you see the data there wiggling along, occasionally jumping up and staying above there for a certain amount of time. Now, if we look at all the little yellow dots there, that's our freezing elevation. And this is at Oroville, where we have this whoop, particular sensor. And we see wild fluctuations during these events where we can warm up and be above 11,000 feet for our freezing elevation. This is where rain turns to snow. Now, we know in the northern Sierra that once we get above 9,500 feet, not a whole lot of watershed that exists above there. So you're having most of the watershed occurring as rain. But then that crashes down to 4,000 feet. And you get rain transitioning to snow. And you can see the snow accumulation there in that gray line behind that freezing elevation. And you see the big jumps there, not much, so much in December, but January, boom, 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 three ARs that form that first flood. All of a sudden we go from 12 inches on up to 18 inches of snow water content at Buck's Lake. Now we look at what happens there in February with the next three, boom, boom, boom. For the second flood, you're looking at almost a full water year worth of snowpack on the ground at this point. When we get into February there, we're looking at the wettest antecedent conditions the watershed had seen for a flood happening, and that's an important part of the story that we'll get to later. Now we see the flow there in the black line, the hydrographs there at Merrimack on the Feather River, showing you know the little small peaks there in December, large peak there in January, and the big volume there in February. Now what we see there is we have, and I've kind of noted some elements on there, we have the freezing elevation, we have the magnitude of the AR, how strong it was, we have the duration, how long those conditions are in place. And then we have the clustering of events because those big floods don't happen with just maybe a single AR coming through, but back to back to back clustering of those atmospheric rivers together. And then the amount of time between them to let the system drain out a bit really is a key element into how we see uh, those flood events and our ability to respond to them. Let's keep moving. All right, so here we have a satellite shot from January 17th showing a nice atmospheric river extending from the Western Pacific all the way to the North, North America. The brighter, warmer colors mean more water vapor, and we see the intertropical convergence zone right there along the tropics where all the water vapor concentrates, but then those ribbons that extend into the mid-latitudes that can get wrapped up in with a low-pressure system. If we go to the next slide, we'll zoom in a little bit. Boom, there we are. We have the U.S., and we can see the leading edge of that atmospheric river, the greens, the wet values leading into the yellows, even wetter, and then that red tip there where we're seeing some pretty intense water vapor coming in. And this is what was going to be our first flood in there. So let's go on to the next slide. So that comes from our satellite data. And that gives us a sense of what was happening as it approaches. Here's another way to look at it. And this is another product from the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. This is kind of a new forecast tool that we developed this winter with them. Now this takes an ensemble forecast from the global forecast system and looks out all 16 days. So you're looking right there from the right side, which would be right at landfall uh, with the west coast of the United States. And we go out 16 days, so we're kind of looking at what's upstream. Now where you see blue means atmospheric river conditions aren't forecast to be present by any of the models. Good anticipation that the conditions will be dry. As we see the greens and the reds and to the purple, that's where you're saying all the models in the ensemble are suggesting atmospheric river conditions are present. Now, in this case, as we said, we had different strengths. This is for that lowest threshold that a uh, vapor transport at 250 flux units. And here we see really not only where and how wide that landfall is, but we can look through time and see how, get a sense of how the models are depicting that evolution and gives us a sense of the duration of conditions at a given latitude. So now if we go on to the next one, we can see now, for this event in January, that was the first one was 250, now here's the 500. And we see the really stronger conditions being there with that first wave and then second and three. So you see one, two, and three there uh, with possibility for strong conditions, but then afterward maybe a little bit of a break. So this gives us a sense of forecasting of what kind of conditions we're up against. And we're continuing to kind of evolve these products, and we'll be using them in the years ahead. Let's go to the next one. Now, here's another product from the center, and this gives us a sense of what the model spread is in terms of what that integrated vapor transport is. As you can see, we have the latitude there. And this is for 38 north. And again, we're looking at that January event. And we look and see in the first that day two, boy, all the models are pretty much in agreement right around that 750 unit, which would be a strong AR. Uh, once we get over 1,000, then we're into the extreme. But then as we see, as we go out those other days, 
the spread really opens up, so you're looking out five days out. Boy, there could be an event that's either nothing, not even qualifying as an AR at that 250 flux unit level, or it could be an extreme. So possibility of something showing up, but really not a whole lot of information. And the idea here is to advance the science, be able to try and tighten that up further out, give us more information about what's coming. All right, so let's talk about the winter because this was really an amazing winter. Now, we saw in the climate division data, we've been warmer than average for the 21st century. We look at winter here, and again, this is from the California Climate Tracker from uh, Western Region Climate Center's uh, website. We can look at the temperature rankings for December, January, February. We see that the Sierra and the North Coast finally got to cooler than average. A lot of the north and in the transverse range in Southern California, we're in that average range, and you see the scale there uh, showing where the percentiles are of this. But we see in uh, kind of the central part of the Central Valley, southern part of the Central Valley, south coast, and in the deserts, we're still in that warmer category in there in the Sonoran Desert, still in the top 10% of temperature values. Now we look over on the precip side, and we see that the whole state through the winter was in that top 10%, with the exception of the Sierra, and the North Lahontan region, which hit a record. So let's keep going. Now we look at a different way from the climate tracker, and we can look at a time series back to 1895. And this data comes from the Cooperative Observer Network of the National Weather Service uh, supports. And we see there for December, January, and February, boom, right there with 1969 statewide uh, as one of the wettest years, not quite 69, less than a tenth of an inch away right there with it. But now let's go look at the temperature. Now, if you go find 1969 on that chart, you see a blue line. That means that temperature was quite a bit cooler than average uh, for that really wet winter. Now let's look at this year's winter, and we're warmer than average. Uh, so we're seeing a warming world. We're seeing patterns we've seen before, but they're happening in a warmer world. So the outcomes are going to play out a little differently. And this is an important thing to consider as we move forward and this will continue is that we can base some of our expectation of what's going to happen on what we've seen before but it's not going to be exactly the same let's go so here let's look and see how some of that played out so what we have here are four charts that we use on the california data exchange center what we have we have three indices along the sierra nevada we'll start in the upper left corner there with the northern sierra eight station index we have eight precip stations along the Sierra Nevada Southern Cascades to give us a sense of how wet the Sacramento River Basin is. This is the primary water supply region, so we like to keep track of there. Now, right below it, we have the San Joaquin Five Station Index, and then up in the upper right, we have the Tulare Basin Six Station Index. So we have an index values here that give us a sense of how wet these different regions are. The light blue there is the spur averages, and we have a number of years there, giving a sense of some historically relevant uh, years as traces to compare to. In the bottom right, we'll get to that in a minute, that's our regional snowpack from our automated snow sensors with the California Cooperative Snow Survey. But up back to the Northern Sierra Aid Station Index, you see, look at that, that dark blue line for this year is bigger than anything else on the chart. We did indeed set a record this year. And as you see, shortly after January, we were uh, hanging with 1983 and then we took off and we went well beyond it. Now, this winter was fantastic on the eight station index, and this is really something that's happened only once before. In December, January, February, normally we get half our annual precip. This year we got more than our annual average precip. And in fact, we set a record. We beat water year 1956, which is the only other year to exceed that annual average of 50 inches. And water year 56 got to about 56 inches uh precipitation in december january february alone that included the december 55 flood uh, big flood large impacts on the feather river system and led to the building of oroville dam this year we exceeded that by over an inch and with it we also had back-to-back -back months in january and february with over 23 inches of precipitation usually we get up into that much precip for a month that is where we do see some of our major floods and in fact we did we saw back-to-back -back events. First time that's happened in a back-to-back -back month. In 1995, we had an event in January and an event in March with the driest February tucked in between. This time back-to-back -back and bigger events than we saw. But another feature you'll see on this chart, as we head south, 
That blue line doesn't quite make it to 83. By the time we get to the Tulare Basin, it's up there with one of the big years, but it's not as impressive. The other element you'll notice is that line flattens out earlier in the year. We start seeing that drying that's more characteristic of South Coastal California with that shutoff being earlier. Uh, the question is, is that something that will continue to be a pattern that we see heading into the future? Now with these big years, so we blew past 83 up there on the Northern Sierra Station Index, but if we go look at the snowpacks there, look at that, not even close to 83 snowpack. It's a big year, but not nearly the snow that was there in 83. So we had more precip, but more of it was rain than it was for snow with 83. And that's another storyline with climate change, more rain, less snow. So we're starting to actually see some of that. Now the interesting thing with the Sierra Nevada is you head south, the mountains get taller. Noticeably taller as you get into the central and southern Sierra. That creates an interesting event because as the upper atmosphere warms, it has the opportunity to hold more water. Still below freezing, so we have the opportunity to actually accumulate more snow and it can catch more snow in those southern watersheds. And we can see that on the snowpack chart where actually for a while both the central and southern Sierra were rivaling that largest snowpack for a while. But then it tapers off. And if you look at the way it mounts out, by the time we get out, we're almost back to our average mount out pattern there. This is interesting because we have to worry about elevation and how snow is distributed in the elevation as it melts out. And that's important, particularly in the central and southern Sierra, because that is when a lot of flood concerns can happen there. They not only have to worry about the winter, they have to worry about the snowmelt floods as well. And in fact, we were activated in flood response well into June when the peak on the Kings River happened right around the beginning of summer. Let's move on. So there it is, 2017 right up there. Again, you look at it statewide, not in those biggest years over 200% anymore. We got to 150%, still quite impressive. Elevation distribution of the snow is different as well. Not as much low elevation snow, a lot of snow tucked into those higher elevations. We also still stayed warmer than that period of record average, that yellow triangle. So we're keeping values that are still warmer and not quite as wet. So let's keep moving. Alrighty, so what happens when you get a big snow year, even like this year? This is something that was really interesting. So what we have is we have Lake Tahoe's elevation. It's from the USGS gauge there at Tahoe City. Now once we get below three feet, that's actually below the natural rim of the lake. So water doesn't flow out into the Truckee River. And we see as we got into the fall there, it fell below that rim. It was below that rim, but then the winter rains and then the spring melt, we actually got all the way up to nine feet. Now why does it get above nine feet? Because they regulate the lake elevation so it does not rise above there to flood uh, people's homes. And so that pushes water out into the Truckee Basin. This is the first time we've gone from below the rim to flood control at that nine foot elevation in a single year. Now let's look at what else happens here. This is from a friend, Steph McAfee, assistant uh, state climatologist for Nevada. She provided this photo to me of the Humboldt Sink, which actually became a lake for a while. Uh, and this is another feature, on the, particularly on the east side of the Sierra, where we get these large snowpack years and it melts out, it gets out into the Great Basin, creates these uh, ephemeral lakes for a while that uh, really change their uh, groundwater recharge systems there in Nevada and affect land use certainly there. So uh, definitely some signs there of, again, a really big year, uh, some observations and how these play out as we move forward. Let's keep going. All right, so another way to look at this year, we'll look at the past 12 months. This is again from the California Climate Tracker, and we have three charts here going from August out through July, so it's past 12 months. And we have on the far left, we have the statewide values there. Now what you see there is that dark black line is the period of record average. The red line is the observations that we had this year. Now you have that dark gray band that's your middle part of the distribution. You get to the light gray, you're at your 10 and 90%, and the light gray indicates your extremes. So we see we hung out slightly above that dark black line statewide. Got into the spring, we got up there into the more extreme temperatures. And we can see with the precip, we were up there beyond the 10 and 90, particularly in January and February statewide. We then jump over there for the Sierra Nevada region and we see similar patterns, a little cooler than average there in January as we had all that rain. In fact, uh, it hit right there at the extreme. 
Uh, but then also a little hitch there in the spring as we got warmer than average. We'll look at the south coast region. And we see, one, precip was up into towards that extreme category there in January. But then the early cutoff where you see it drops down almost flat and flat lines there from kind of March onward. But also notice that the temperature there really bubbles up. And we're seeing those really warm temperatures, particularly in the southern part of the state. All right, so let's keep going here. And then again, we look now October through July. This is as far as we have with our data for this water year. We see that with that kind of early drying, particularly in the south, we've fallen off the pace. We're now in the fourth wettest year. We have um, 83, 95, and 98 in terms of the statewide years that were bigger than this year. But again, if we look and we go look at those temperatures, you look at 83, 95, and 98, you see blue bars, which indicates a cooler than the average baseline that they use. But this year, we're continuing a stretch there, uh, very warm temperatures. And you see the record warmth there earlier on. All right, so kind of continuing this theme, and we keep going. We'll go to the regional plots, the next one there. And we'll see here, so October through July, we lost our green. Uh, we have mostly warmer than average there. Still hanging on North Coast Sierra and North Lahontan regions, kind of hanging out in that average region of the distribution. Everywhere else warmer, that, and that's the maximum temperatures. Minimum temperatures, the temperatures that we really see with climate change and the warming, and this is where we see it, almost the whole state there, are still in that top 10 percentile, except with the extreme heat down there in the Sonoran Desert, which set records. Now, another place that set a record, and I put a star there, was Death Valley. And in July, I had a really interesting thing happen. Recorded an average temperature for the month of 107.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the warmest monthly temp average temperature recorded in North America. They're checking to see if it becomes a new world record. Uh, you look at the average high there of 119.6 degrees for an average daily high temperature. 13 days over 120 degrees. But look at your nighttime temperatures. Your average low is 95.6 degrees Fahrenheit. There were only two nights where it got below 90 degrees in Death Valley, and then it only got to 89 degrees. Phenomenally hot weather now. Death Valley is one of the lowest points in, in the continental U.S. Uh, so you really are an area where you do see some extremes. But here is an indication that we're seeing some really, really hot weather and yet another aspect of, again, an epic water year. All right, so part of that epic water year and the two big floods, thought it'd be good to talk about some of the emergency response experiences that we got to experience this year and kind of look at how this is an example and the chance to take some lessons learned as we move forward. So here we go in January, we have our emergency response structure in a flood ops center where we go into a flood ops center, we have our locals reporting in we work with OES, we work with our federal partners, and we coordinate information and we make sure that the governor's office and OES and department executives are all informed and they're up to date. They know what's happening as the flood unfolds. And this works well, great work in the flood center. But then uh, February happened and it had some really interesting things scale up. So if we go there, we have, first of all, we have the Oroville incident. And first to look at this, plot put together, kind of showing a timeline of events that happened in the emergency. But if you see those values there where the first um, damage to the spillway occurred, a pretty good flood peak there. If you consider your average winter flows coming into Orville are only around 8,000, and you see there you're well above 100,000 CFS coming into the reservoir when that happens. And even that, it only drops down to around 80,000. So from there until it finally gets down further on in there, you have a tremendous volume of water coming into the reservoir, trying to manage that while working with a broken spillway and navigating some things that we just haven't dealt with before. Again, this was the wettest antecedent conditions coming into a flood and being managed with a broken spillway. If we go to the next slide, you can see a picture of what happened. This is on uh, the department's pixel page where you can see the aftermath of the event uh, with the structure. However, that wasn't the only thing going on in the state. That was a big enough challenge in and of itself, but we also have huge challenges on the um, central coast there, including the Pfeiffer Canyon Bridge, which failed, and you can see a picture of it there. Uh, later on in the spring, that wasn't the only thing that happened. You then had the large landslide that happened on the coast there, taking out Highway 1, as you see there. 
Now, we're working with some folks uh, in the California Geological Survey and the U.S. Geological Survey looking at how atmospheric river conditions relate to these large slide events, as well as other slides and alluvial fan movements to see if we can hopefully generate some good relations that can help forecast that. But let's keep going, because that wasn't the only thing going on. Southern California uh, experiencing some significant flooding. We see Los Angeles there in the middle, some shots around San Diego there. Uh, as they dealt with their own atmospheric river and the consequences of those. While we're working with that, up in the Sierra, we see landslides, we see trees down, we see traffic snarled on I-80. Uh, we see Highway 50 there as a canyon coming in towards Lake Tahoe. And you see in that really wet snowpack, and then you put a flood on top of it, uh, the challenges of trying to manage uh, roads that start to look like rivers. So we had to scale up our response structure. So you have, instead of just dealing with the local events, and there were over 60 of them going on active at the point in February, you have the Oroville Field Division working on the Oroville crisis. You have Delta Field Division working on incidents going on with Delta infrastructure. And then you have the State Water Project trying to manage uh, water for the State Water Project all going on. So all of that happening across the department, the department organized in a department ops center so they could let every individual group provide their information, but they could then fold it up and then report to the State Operations Center and the Unified Command. And with Unified Command, you have the Governor's Office, you have FEMA, you have the California National Guard, OES, Highway Patrol, Caltrans, CAL FIRE, all reporting information coming in and all the different things that happen. Now, understand that NOAA keeps track of billion-dollar disasters, and they look at these. And as we start to unfold in this event, we notice that uh, if you look at some of the things I have, um, with Caltrans noting that they had almost a billion dollars of damage into the road system just in that one sector. So this was quite a notos notable event, notable part way for organizing a structure that we don't use very often. And not only do you have to unfold and execute this as an emergency is happening, you're trying to learn how to do this as well. So here's some shots that I got to take as part of that experience. I got to fly with the National Guard. And so we have here a shot of the Lagunitas region. And you actually see how it got its name as all these little lakes start to form with the heavy precip. Our next slide, we can look at uh, New Don Pedro Reservoir. And I show the spillway gates there because as we got into February and they filled up, they had to deal with opening those reservoir um, gates, and when that happens, that actually initiates flooding in Modesto. And so the coordination and timing of that and trying to mitigate damage downstream, important element. Uh, now as we get on the San Joaquin Valley floor and managing some of the elements of subsidence and water maybe not going everywhere, we had expectations of it going some places, ponding up a little bit. Here near Stevenson, you can see the, the bridge there in the background, and about a quarter mile away is where the river channel is water coming towards um, the state park area where uh, was touring with the National Guard. Here flying to the north, Sutter Buttes there off to the bit, um, edge of the screen there looking forward. You can see uh, one of the bypass structures there and the Sacramento River and the overflow to the west. As we keep going uh, further south down into the Yolo Bypass region and just seeing a uh, concept of the Inland Sea reforming with this year. And we go to our next slide, and we're here near Maxwell. Now here's where we get events within events. And Maxwell's over on the west side, over in Lee of the Coastal Range, well away from the Sacramento River. But here we see a whole bunch of water with a lot of light-colored sediment, indicating that we had a coastal evulsion event, a lot of sediment coming out from the Coastal Range. And we go back and we look, and sure enough, there's a training of thunderstorms. That means storms that just follow over the same area for over 12 hours. A lot of water, same place. A lot of water and sediment then pushed out onto the valley floor uh, from the coastal range. Uh, all that happening in February, there's also something else that happens in February, and I learned this from our, our locals in the Stanislaus OES. And uh, we have the almond bloom. Here's a shot of some of the almond trees in bloom in February as we're flying. This is the world's largest pollination event. And we have um, two-thirds of the nation's bees in the state to help with this pollination event. So this is quite it, staggering to me uh, to see it. And to see it from the sky, really impressive. 
So while we have all that going on, we still have the state's uh, activities still happening and in place. So let's finish this off here. So what are your 2017? We continue our 21st century elements or record-breaking elements to the water year. This year with our winter precip, again on that eight station index, only the second time we got more than an annual average in three months. Uh, hanging out there with water year 56. In this case, then we have the summer heat. We have Death Valley with this new record. Uh, other records that we had while we're still looking into, we may have a new wind gust record up near Lake Tahoe. Uh, we had a, an anemometer which survived with a reading of 195 miles an hour. And so we're looking into that and making sure that it is a valid reading. If it is, we will submit it for a new uh, record wind gust uh, for the National Center for Environmental Information. As we move into a warming world, it changes the way those familiar weather patterns unfold. We get new extremes or new passes to the extremes and new outcomes that fall outside the historical record. Makes relying on, boy, this is how we did things in the past. It's helpful to know that, but understand that how things are going to unfold from here on out are going to have some new, new wrinkles to them. And what are your 2017? We had some new opportunities in emergency response. We really learned about the investments over the past decade with flood states, and we really saw the benefit of that with the local standing up, really being able to respond, having a greater capacity to manage the emergencies, and that really facilitates then the way the state and then the federal agencies come together and manage, certainly with, again, back-to-back -back months of uh, extreme events. And that brings us to this next question. Was this a once-in-a-lifetime event, or is this valuable experience that will be tapped in as we keep moving forward? And I have a good feeling it's the second one there. Um, well, something to live through, but hang on to your hats, gang. This might be something we have to get ready for in the coming years. But we want to say, what are your, your 2017? There are a lot of successes in that response, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned, and there'll probably be a while to dig through both the science and in the response uh, and how we fold that information into our planning and implementation. A lot of lessons learned, good opportunity here to do so. And, with that, I say stay tuned for our coming water year. There will be more adventures to be had. And with that, we'll move to any questions. Uh, if you have questions later on, if you look at this later on and you still want to ask me something, my email address is there. Feel free to email me, and I'll do my best to answer your question.